Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. So a lot of you are probably aware that Dr. Avi Loeb and others believe that a muamua may very well have been an artificial object. But did you know that their theories were inspired by an actual project, a photon engine designed to send a probe from our solar system to Alpha Centauri in the space of a couple of decades? And did you also know that Caltech has made a series of astonishing breakthroughs in recent years that may make this project a reality sometime next decade? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Got a quick follow-up announcement to make. Once again, my first tour date in Europe. Turns out that it's going to be in Ireland, just outside of the city of Cork. Um, at a very special place, the National Space Center. It's an Earth station with lots of amazing uh, radio equipment, that is to say uh, radio astronomy and also uh, space communications equipment, and they are in the midst of trying to restore service to their big radio dish. But in any event, I'm going to be there helping them with a fundraiser. And then the day after, which is going to be Wednesday the 18th from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. at this facility, that's when I will kick off my European tour with the topic, How SpaceX Will Save the World. It's 10 euros uh, in advance or 15 euros at the door. The details are in the description. And in order to continue this tour across Europe, I am essentially trying to raise is about 300 euros per location in order to be able to fund this. I don't want to fund it with high ticket prices. I want everybody to have an opportunity to attend. So if you'd like to support this whole endeavor, you know how to do it. And also, I'd like to thank my new Patreon members who jumped in trying to get me to that magic 1% of my subscribers that will be necessary in order to essentially change the future of this channel, and that is L Sheep, and also Thomas Wallstrom, and finally, Caleb Ufton. And Caleb, by the way, upgraded his membership uh, almost immediately after joining. I want to thank my new members right now. We're about 30% of the way to that 1%. So if you would like to support this channel and also take advantage of all the incredible benefits that come with Patreon membership, well, you know how to do it. And by the way, all of you members, you're getting to see this video hours ahead of everyone else. Okay, that's enough self-promotion. Let's move on to the topic at hand. So a lot of you may have heard of a photon engine or um, what's also called the Breakthrough Starshot program, but what you may not have heard is that there have been lots of new developments associated with this program that were rolled out only a few weeks ago, and uh, lots of breakthroughs in terms of the types of materials that are going to be necessary, lots of breakthroughs in terms of just what sort of lasers are going to to be required for the job. And for those of you unfamiliar with all of this, if you're confused about what I'm talking about, the idea is to use a light sail powered by high intensity lasers rather than the sun in order to give it that initial burst of acceleration. And when we're talking about a burst of acceleration, we're talking about going from zero to 60,000 kilometers per second in the space of 10 minutes. In other words, bringing Mars within reach with a total transit time of only about 20 minutes, about three hours out to Jupiter and Alpha Centauri in just a couple of decades. So in this video, I'm going to be referencing a number of quotes from a presentation that was given to the Interstellar Research Group not that long ago. And in this presentation, Caltech talks about why would we want to send probes like the Breakthrough Starshot out to nearby stars in the first place. In other words, stars 10 light years away or less. It would take about half a century for a probe traveling at 20% of the speed of light to reach these destinations. In other words, 
a few years longer than the Voyager probes had been in operation. Now think about that for a moment. If we had been able to launch a breakthrough Starshot probe in 1977 when Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 set out, they would be closing in on the Proxima Centauri system right now. They also pointed out the kinds of images that we've gotten from the Hubble Space Telescope and others of objects like Pluto compared to the images that we received from the New Horizons probe. As you can see, the difference is startling. There's no substitute for going there. So if a breakthrough starshot light sail was making its way through our solar system, what might it see? Well, it would see quite a lot, actually. Let's say that it was approaching our planet and it was at a distance of a little less than three astronomical units. And by the way, that's two hours away from closest approach. Probes traveling at this kind of velocity cover a tremendous amount of distance in no time at all. And there's the image that we would see at a distance of a little over one and a half astronomical units. And then finally, at closest approach, approximately 0.12 astronomical units, or a little over 17 million kilometers, well, you get to see all the details that you would want. You would not only realize that Earth was a planet capable of housing life, but also you would see all the techno signatures. And you want to hear something really spooky? A Muamua passed within 0.16175 astronomical units of Earth, about 24 million kilometers roughly the same distance, and if it was an interstellar probe with the same kind of instrument pack that one of our probes might carry, well, whoever made it will be well aware of the fact that Earth not only is home to life, but also is home to a technically advanced civilization. And you want to hear something even spookier? If whoever made a Muamua has some sort of outpost in the Alpha Centauri system, given the fact that a Muamua passed through our solar system back in 2017, that means they're aware of our presence now. But wait a minute, wait a minute, if some of you are saying, a Muamua is traveling nowhere near 20% of the speed of light. It bears no resemblance to breakthrough star shot whatsoever. Well, as you're going to find out a little bit later on in the video, that's not entirely accurate either. But how does this work anyway? I mean, breakthrough star shot, we hear about the whole concept, but what is really going to be required? Well, first of all, if you're going to be powering it from the ground, you're going to need a massive laser array capable of generating about one gigawatts worth of energy in total in order to provide the necessary velocity or rather the necessary power transferred to the sail in order to push it to the desired velocity. Now, how does it push it? Well, the photons essentially transfer their momentum directly to the sail as long long as it is reflective enough. Photons weigh almost nothing. However, since they're traveling so ridiculously fast, they transfer a considerable amount of momentum to a reflective surface. It has to be really, really reflective though, and it has to be extremely lightweight. We're talking about a sail that weighs a gram. Now, as you can see from this illustration, they're calling for a 100 gigawatt array. They've managed to scale that down to 50 gigawatts with an enormous amount of laser energy being concentrated on the object per square centimeter, enough to where you would think it would completely destroy the sail, but that is actually not the case. Caltech has proposed utilizing a material called silicon nitride, which can be made into a very reflective surface. It's also extremely resilient and extremely lightweight. Believe it or not, they've already come up with a proposed structure that can make a sizable sail weigh only a gram, and also a tiny instrument pack together with laser communications whereby this object could take photographs and then beam the information back to Earth. But what about the shape of the object? That is an interesting problem. Flat light sails don't beam ride very easily. They lose their stability and as a result they've come up with some other ideas on how to make them a little bit more stable. Now this is another design. You can make it sort of parabolic 
click and also make it spin by the way that adds a lot more stability but it's also very very difficult to make a sail that's shaped like this so back to a flat sail that rotates in such a way to provide it with the necessary stability and interestingly enough a mua mua rotates as well and rotates very consistently even when it was accelerating the rotation remained absolutely unchanged which is something a natural object wouldn't have done through natural outgassing but okay let's get back to starshot and the fact that this isn't just a bunch of slick cgi graphics in the laboratory they've already been doing tangible experiments on a variety of different types of materials shapes etc to determine the types of laser radiation pressure that's going to be necessary, what kind of laser radiation these materials are going to be hold, able to hold up under, because this is a lot of laser energy concentrated onto a small amount of space, although most of these materials should be able to hold up just fine under this kind of laser pressure. And then finally, the engine. Now, the engine is not on the ship. This is one of the big departures when we're talking about light sails. Light sails don't have an engine. Instead, the engines are on the ground or preferably in orbit. If you don't have the interference of the atmosphere, you're gonna be able to deliver a lot more laser energy to the light sail with a lot less power. But this is one concept of how this photon engine would actually appear. Once again, pretty huge and vast amounts of power going through all of this, but none of that power and none of the fuel, nothing is required on the light sail itself. As a matter of fact, the sail only weighs a gram. Now, one of the reasons that the object has to be so damn light is because you're transferring a tremendous amount of energy to the sail in only 10 minutes in order to get that speed up to the desired velocity. If you did it more gradually, then the sail could be heavier. However, the way it's described, we're talking 20% of the speed of light in a mere 10 minutes. That means you're looking at reaching the moon in about six seconds you're looking at reaching mars in 15 minutes all the way to the sun in 40 minutes jupiter in about two and a half hours saturn in less than six hours and finally pluto 20 hours and hold on to your hats you would blow past voyager one in about five and a half days this is some serious velocity, and it gives you an impression of just how far away the nearest stars are, given the fact that it's gonna take two decades to get to Alpha Centauri, even at this incredible velocity. But how do you slow down? Well, the fact of the matter is, you don't slow down, at least not with the current plan. Therefore, you would fly straight through the Proxima system and close to your target planet, Proxima B, which is right inside the Goldilocks zone and may very well have a habitable atmosphere and an ocean. Although we can't be certain of that, and only going there is going to give us that information. Nevertheless, it would be an amazing journey to say the least, and if we pulled it off, it would demonstrate that interstellar travel would be a possibility. And by the way, this concept is scalable. The only restriction really is the g-forces you're talking about here. Accelerating to 20% of the speed of light in the space of 10 minutes would inflict about 1600 G's on the passengers, enough obviously to turn them into pulp, perhaps a new coat of paint on one side of the ship, and that's about it. So obviously, if you applied the same amount of energy to a bigger sail, therefore getting a smaller amount of G-force acceleration, say a constant one and a half G, assuming you had a good enough laser array to hit your target a lot further out, then you could use your laser array to provide a constant 1G acceleration all the way out to your destination 
position. You would, of course, require another laser array at the receiving end in order to slow you down. But before we get to decelerating, you may have also noticed that an orbital beacon is going to be required for phasing, that is to say, aiming properly to make sure that you can maintain your laser beam on your target for a sustained amount of time. And then finally, the last topic that you're looking at right at the moment is the cost. The main expense is not going to be the laser sales themselves, or even the hundreds of laser sales that this project is actually going to send out. We anticipate that they're going to be losing a large number of these probes in interstellar space, so they're going to be sending them out one at a time until hundreds of them are making their way to Proxima Centauri. But again, that's not the vast majority of the expense. It is instead the engine or rather the lasers. But interestingly enough, at least according to Caltech, they're looking at a cost of 10 cents per watt perhaps getting down to as low as a penny a watt. In other words, the entire engine costing about half a billion dollars, or at most, five billion dollars. A pathetically small amount of money compared to other types of things the government pays for. And then as far as communications are concerned, well, it uses what's called an optical phased array being by meta surfaces. Yeah, that sounds pretty complicated, but it essentially means that the entire light sail functions as sort of a low energy laser used to communicate back with Earth. In other words, not communicating via radio the way all of our probes have in the past, but rather with laser communications the way that the 16 Psyche probe is going to be doing very soon now when it launches in just a few days. By the way, I'm going to be covering that mission as well, at least as completely as I possibly can. Getting back to Starshot, here's the probe itself if you want to have a look at it. It's four meters in diameter, which incidentally is about the same size as some of the UFOs we've been observing as of late, and it comes complete with all kinds of amazing instrumentation, including lensless color cameras, also radioisotope power cells, not all that different than what we use in existing probes today, except very, very thin, essentially just a film of radioisotopes providing the power. And in addition to that, you have magnetometers on board and the necessary laser communications to beam back about 100 kilobits worth of information at a time. No, that's not very much data, but it's a lot more than Voyager was sending to us four decades ago. So this is their proposal. But how do you slow it down? Well, again, Starshot is not planning on slowing down, but it could, in theory, be done. I have a paper linked in the description entitled Deceleration of High Velocity Interstellar Photon Sails into Bound Orbits at Alpha Centauri. <sighs> The idea is to not target Proxima Centauri, but rather Alpha Centauri in order to slow down the light sail significantly enough to be captured by the trinary star system's gravity. And you have to get pretty damn close. You're talking approximately three stellar radii from Alpha Centauri, which is the largest of the three stars. It's actually a star very similar to our own in order to decelerate sufficiently in order to be able to enter into orbit. That's really close to a star, close enough to where the temperature is approximately 100,000 degrees Kelvin. So you'd be looking at lots of heat shielding on top of reflectivity and everything else that you would need for a solar sail in order to accomplish this. But once again, in theory, it can be done. Oh yeah, also if you pass that close to the star, getting what's called a photogravitational assist to slow down, the g-forces would once again be about 1600 g's to slow you down sufficiently. If your velocity wasn't quite that high, then passing within say a quarter of an astronomical unit of a large star would give you a lot of a photogravitational assist. And you know where I'm going with this one. That's exactly what Oumuamua did. 
did. It passed within a quarter of an astronomical unit of the sun, getting a hell of a lot of solar energy in the process. And here's the spookiest thing of all. We have no idea how fast Oumuamua was going when it entered the solar system. I mean, we can guess based on the velocity that we observed when Oumuamua was already well past our planet, but we never saw it coming. We can't say with any kind of authority how quick this object was actually going when it passed into our solar system or whether or not it may have significantly decelerated while it was approaching the sun. Because if it was a light sail, that's exactly what it would have done, and that's exactly what Breakthrough Starshock can do as well if we want a slower and more detailed flyby, or if we want our probes to get captured by the sun's gravity. And if we do that, that means we're putting probably quite a lot of interstellar probes into somebody else's backyard. Is there somebody there to watch them? Somebody there who might recover them? Somebody who might want to trace them back to where they came from? Well, all of these things are not going to be answered until well into the future, because the ideal time to set out for Alpha Centauri with Breakthrough Starshot would be 2035, a little over a decade away. In theory, we can accomplish this in the time that we have left. All we need now is relatively modest funding and somebody to actually take interest. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe. It's so important to my channel. And also please check the description for various ways to support this content so I can keep bringing it to you. And as always, stay angry about space.